Okay, so in the previous segment, we uh, encountered the polar decomposition. This is a fundamental property of um, the deformations that uh, underlie continuum mechanics. And as we will see, uh, in, as, as we move ahead, it is going to reappear at various points and give us further insight into the nature of, um, the nature not just of motion and deformation, but also the nature of uh, constitutive material response about what it means to write out the stresses and energies and so forth. For now, let me um, sh uh, go back, uh, take a step back towards um, our um, strain tensor, the Lagrange strain tensor, and say something about it, okay? Um, the Lagrange strain tensor Okay, remember that E is one half C minus the isotropic tensor, but I want to write C as F transpose F right now. And we'll just remember that this is simply the right Cauchy green tensor C. The reason I've written it out as F transpose F here is that I want to demonstrate that this definition of strain is already fundamentally nonlinear in our deformation gradient, right? Because it involves an F transpose F, so you may think about it as being quadratic in the deformation gradient F, okay? So first thing to note, uh, this is um, quadratic. in F. What this means is that this fundamental measure of our kinematics is already nonlinear. The, the kind of elasticity we are going to study as we get further into material response is uh, what we will term nonlinear elasticity, which means we are not going to assume linear response. And we'll see in more detail what that means. But a very important aspect of the, of, of the nonlinearity of elasticity is the fact that this strain tensor itself is already fundamentally nonlinear in our most primitive definition of um, deformation gradients and strain. Okay? So there's fundamental nonlinearity which is actually inescapable here. And we will see why it is inescapable. Actually, we'll see more about it in, right now. Okay. So we have this quadratic nature of E. What E does because of, its, because of its structure is to fundamentally, in a mathematically exact manner, nullify the effect of rotations, okay? What it does is to leave us with strains that reflect the effect only of stretching the material, not of rotating it. And you recall at the end of the last segment, we demonstrated that the deformation gradient F fundamentally involves rotations and stretches, always, right? Okay, so let's observe what, what E does, okay. Um, so recall the polar decomposition. Okay. I'm going to take a step that we already took in the previous segment. I'm essentially going to repeat it here, which is, okay, what, recall the polar decomposition, which is F equals RU, right? Where R belongs to SO3 and U, we've decided, we demonstrated is positive, sorry, we said U is symmetric. We also demonstrated that it's positive definite because its eigenvalues we've chosen to be positive, right? So we're going to indicate that with an S plus here, okay? Implying that it's positive, definite, and symmetric. Okay, so 
What this implies for E is the following. Let's get back here. E, which is F transpose F, we know we can write uh, F transpose as U transpose R transpose, as we saw in the previous segment. F remains R U minus isotropic tensor. And in a step that we employed in the last segment, we see that the effect of the rotations are nullified. The rotations essentially kill each other, right, because of the fact that we have F transpose F in there in the definition of E. Furthermore, given the fact that U is symmetric, uh, we have therefore that E is one half U square minus the isotropic tensor, okay? What this implies is, we've already said what it implies, but I'm going to state it, uh, are the rotations imposed on material neighborhoods of X, right? So we have a neighborhood around the, around a, a reference position X, and that, that neighborhood, as we saw at the end of the last segment, fundamentally does undergo rotation under the deformation, right? But that effect of the rotation has been mathematically exactly canceled out in our definition of the strain here. So are the rotations imposed in material neighborhoods of X play no role in E. So what effect does this have? Let's suppose we have a rigid body motion. Okay, so now we're saying that the deformation or the motion of this material of, 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 the, of this block of our, uh, the motion of this body, right, we have our basis here, relative to this basis, our motion, the, the motion of our body can be described exactly as a rigid body motion, right, no, no distortion. Okay, so what this means is now if you consider, consider a rigid body motion, okay, how is our rigid body motion defined? We, we saw quite a few segments ago that rigid body motion in general is defined as CT where C is a vector plus a rotation tensor Q acting on X, right, where Q belongs to SO3, it is a rotation, and C is a translation vector, right? But now, what is the F that arises from this motion? F, which is partial of phi with respect to reference position, is simply Q. Okay? We can also write this, by the way, uh, as F equals Q times isotropic tensor, because the isotropic tensor comes for free. Q belongs to SO3, of course, and the isotropic tensor we know is symmetric, just like U, and the eigenvalues of the isotropic tensor are 1, 1, 1, and 1, okay? And 1, 1, and 1 are positive real numbers. So, one, so, so the isotropic tensor here is, is serving the role of the stretch tensor U, of the right stretch tensor U, okay? Um, so, just as we expect, just as we proved before, this deformation, a rigid motion, does admit the polar decomposition, does admit the right polar decomposition, okay? Because this belongs to S plus of 3, okay? It just so happens that the rotation is uniform across the entire body, right? The entire body is going undergoing the same rotation. It's not like the material, one material point is undergoing one rotation and another one is going, undergoing another, 
Likewise, the entire body is undergoing a, 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 a uniform stretch. The, uniform, the stretch is one, right? Essentially, material vectors are not being stretched here, okay? In a rigid motion. Um, okay, what does this imply for E then? E, which is, in this case, one half F transpose F, but F is just Q, so we have Q transpose Q minus isotropic tensor, which is dead zero, always, forever, right? So our body could be spinning around till the end of time. The strain, the Lagrange strain as measured in it, is going to be dead zero, always, okay? This matters because now, if you, if you, if we're looking ahead now a little, but then if we think of, st of storing energy in this material because of its strains, well, the strains are zero. So if you think of a material that's non, that's unstrained as having no energy, that works, right? And that sort of ties in with our physical notion of what should happen in a rigid motion, right? There is no storage of elastic energy. We, later on, we'll define these terms much more precisely, okay? So this is a good thing about our, about our, about our, um, uh, Lagrange strain tensor, right? It's zero for a rigid motion. However, if you were to be doing infinitesimal strain, this would not be the case, okay? So, if you were to be doing the infinitesimal strain theory, okay? In that case, epsilon is the strain tensor, the, the infinitesimal strain tensor, and we know from definition that epsilon is defined as one-half the gradient of u plus the gradient of u transpose. Okay? Let's see how this works out. Recall that um, phi can always be written as x plus u, where u is the displacement. Okay? Therefore, partial of phi with respect to x is the isotropic tensor plus the gradient of u with respect to the reference position, okay? For our rigid motion, we're calling it rigid body motion, right? For rigid body motions, we have F equals Q, which is isotropic tensor plus partial of u with respect to x. The reason I've gone through this is to show us that the displacement gradient, which is what enters the definition of the infinitesimal strain, is Q minus the isotropic tensor in this case. Okay? So epsilon is one-half Q um, plus Q transpose minus twice of the isotropic tensor. Okay? All right, just from the definition of, of, of epsilon involving the displacement gradient plus the displacement gradient transpose and substituting there. 